grits and cornbread. Now, for folks who are not Southerners, grits are made from corn. And in cornbread, obviously, we, that's self-explanatory where that comes from. I think even Yankees will know that cornbread comes from corn, too. So the uh, thing that I was a good Southerner, I just cannot see driving down the road burning up my grits and cornbread in the fuel tank of my GMC Yukon that I used as my office, actually, when I was making house calls as the medical doctor. I hear our Democrat colleagues talk about we need to remove the subsidies for the oil companies. Well, the American people need to know that those subsidies are actually tax credits. They're not true subsidies as such. In fact, Harry Reid was recently wanting a subsidy for gold mining in his home state of Nevada. He also wanted us to continue funding the Cowboy uh, Poetry Festival in his home state. We've got to stop spending this outrageous funds that the federal government's been spending. And we need to start creating jobs in a strong economy. And the best way to do that is get rid of these policies of this administration that are destroying jobs, destroying our economy, increasing the cost of gas and diesel fuel for farmers and everybody in this country. But back to my egg producer friend, I've got a chart here that we made up in our, in our um, office, a dozen eggs in Georgia. We have uh, the subsidies for, which are really not subsidies for the, for the oil companies, they're just tax credits. But we have subsidies for ethanol production, which are true subsidies. And our administration is trying to pick winners and losers, and one of the winners that they picked is ethanol production. And that's been a total failure. And what's that done? It's increased the cost of gasoline. It's increased the cost of food across this country, too. In fact, major ingredient in feed for chickens is corn. Corn, when I was farming back a number of years ago, was two dollars and a half a bushel. Now it's approaching eight dollars a bushel. In 2005, before this ethanol subsidy, total feed costs per dozen eggs. So when a consumer goes out and buys a dozen eggs, the food cost in that dozen eggs was 21 cents per dozen of eggs. Now, 2011, it's approximately 52 cents per dozen. So who pays for that? Does the egg producer? No. The consumer, when you go to the grocery store and buy a dozen eggs, you're paying more money for the failed policies of this administration, particularly as it has to do with energy. And if we start drilling for oil, tapping into our natural, natural gas supplies, start producing coal, particularly doing the clean coal technology that we have, having an all above energy policy, what's going to be the outcome, long-term outcome for the American consumer? Every single American. It's going to lower the cost of eggs and milk and bread because it's going to lower the cost of the production of all the foodstuffs. Every single good and service in this country is affected by these high, high fuel costs of gasoline and fuel oil, diesel fuel, et cetera. The people who are going to be hurt most are the poor people. Those on limited incomes, our senior citizens. And I hear over and over again our Democrat colleagues talk about Republicans are in the back pockets of big oil. Wrong. I'd like to see us end all subsidies, all of them, but particularly ethanol subsidy, which has not made any sense whatsoever. And let's start developing our own energy resources, which will create jobs here in America. Just yesterday and today, we we're debating three bills that came out of our Natural Resources Committee. Those three bills will start us being able to tap into the energy 
God-given energy resources that we have in this country. Help us to be less dependent upon foreign sources for energy. If the president will ever sign those three bills into law, the short-term effect is going to be 220,000, no, 200, I think it's been estimated 200,000 new jobs are going to be created. 200,000 new jobs will be created just with those three bills, just to be able to open up developing our own energy resources here in America that the president is blocking. Long term, those three bills, it's estimated, will create 1.2 new, 1.2 million new jobs here in the United States. American jobs help create a stronger economy. The policies of this administration, the failed energy policies of this administration, are hurting job creation, they're hurting our economy, they're raising the cost of gasoline, they're raising the cost of diesel fuel, they're raising the cost of fuel oil, they're going to hurt egg producers and thus egg consumers, consumers of all goods and services. Your food costs are going to go up, the cost of every goods and service in this country is going to go up all because of the failed policies of this administration, because we cannot develop our own energy resources, our God-given resources that we have in this country. I submit if a nation is not energy independent, it's not a secure nation. And that's where we are today. We've got to become energy independent. And how is that going to happen? Former U.S. Senator Everett Dirksen one time said, when he feels the heat, he sees the light. The most powerful political force in America is embodied in the first three words of the U.S. Constitution, we the people. When we the people start contacting members of Congress, particularly the Democrat members of the House and the members of the U.S. Senate, and demanding that we de develop our own energy resources here in America, that we have an all-of-above energy policy that looks at everything, nuclear energy, alternative sources, clean coal, oil, gas, everything, which we must do. And that's what Republicans are fighting for. If enough people all over this country will contact their senators and their members of Congress and say, let's develop our own energy resources, let's develop American jobs, let's develop a strong economy here in America, then we can do so. But it's up to we the people to be able to demand that from your elected representatives. Thank you, for Mr. Pierce, for yielding me some time and I appreciate the great job you're doing as chairman of the Western Caucus. I'm honored to be a part of that caucus, and I appreciate your yielding me some time tonight. I thank the gentleman. And I encourage, before I yield back, I encourage people to go on my website, brown, B R O U N dot house dot gov, and they can actually look at all the things on this chart, and so they can look at it in fine detail and understand how high energy costs are creating high prices for eggs in the grocery store. Thank you, Mr. Thanks Peterson. the gentleman you for his uh, comments and, and his perceptions. Uh, as he mentioned, it seems that Washington has a war on profits. I think that maybe our friends on the other side of the aisle don't understand that profits pay high salaries. If you work in an industry with no profits, you work at low salaries. Profits pay to reinvest in new buildings creating construction dollars in neighborhoods. Profits are put into youth training, baseball leagues, soccer leagues. Profits are reinvested into new equipment, causing manufacturing firms to thrive. Profits are invested in dividends, and they cause increased values of stocks, helping retirees. And finally, Profits are the only thing that corporations pay tax on. They do not pay taxes on losses. And so when we begin to talk about taking away the profits of companies, understand that we're talking about undermining the American way of life. This attack on profits is, attack, is an attack on the American way of life. I'm pleased to be joined tonight by a good friend from Utah, uh, Mr. Bishop, and would like to yield him as much time as he would consume. I thank Chairman Pierce from New Mexico for using the Western Caucus to um, illustrate some of these ideas and situations that are here. 
I'm also grateful that Mr. Brown from Georgia was just here and tried to show how whenever you have a policy that prohibits or discriminates or lessens the amount of energy that we have in this country, it has a direct impact on individuals and people. As he was showing, it has a direct impact on the cost of food. For every dime that diesel fuel increases, that's $400 million the agricultural industry has to put on to the cost of food. Not just, not just in transporting the food, but for the fertilizer to grow it, for the boxing, the shipping, the manufacturing of it, all of those things are added to it. For every penny that the cost of gasoline increases at the pump, that is $1 billion that's taken out of the household income of Americans. And who is that going to impact the worst? Obviously, the people at the lower end of the economic scale who have the most difficult time to making their budget stretch to pay for higher transportation costs through fuel, for higher food costs because fuel goes up, for higher heating costs because fuel goes up, they're the ones who are hurt. And they're the ones who are, who are taking place. Now, I also appreciate, Mr. Pierce, for illustrating that this actually, actually, that we have a situation in which the West, without trying to be specific to a region, but the West has been treated with the heaviest hand over the past few years and has suffered the greatest consequences of that heavy hand. Last year, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, they simply said that the region that had the highest unemployment for last year and the year before happened to be the West. Six of the top 12 states that had the largest decline in employment to population ratio since the recession that began in 2007 are found in the West. Three of the top five states showing the most stress last year in the summer were found in the West. And unfortunately, Washington's misguided policies over the last several years are simply making these situations worse. Let me, if I could, talk about a couple of specific situations that I have found in my state that have added to this problem of what we call the war on the West because they have had the, the, the dual whammy of not only increasing the price of energy, which is the price of living and the price of doing business, but at the same time decreasing jobs in our particular area. Part of that becomes because the West simply has, as a, as a region, over half of its land owned by the federal government. This government was not planned this way, it just kind of happened, owns one out of every three acres in the United States. But west of Denver, it owns one out of every two acres in the United States. And we get to have the fun of working with the heavy hand of the federal government on all sorts of efforts, especially when a Department of Interior has unlimited arbitrary and capricious powers given to them. For example, the Bureau of Land Management the state of Utah went through what they are called regional management plans. I have 16 areas. Half of them went through a regional management plan. The people on the ground who were working there, who lived there and know that area, spent seven years in developing a regional management plan, which means, simply, how will the land owned by the federal government, and remember it's still half of it, how will the land be used for development purposes? Seven years, they held the public hearings, they went through all the process, they came up with their plan. The Secretary of Interior came into office and on the first day, he simply, uh, in the first few days, he simply said, those plans don't fit the needs of this country because it authorizes 77 oil and gas leases, places where the professionals on the ground determined that the best use of government land was used to develop oil and gas in the state of Utah. The Secretary simply said no. He believed the last administration had made a rush to judgment. And therefore, it was in his best decision to suspend not only those oil leases, but also the, the land management plans at the same time. He did it simply by the stroke of his signature. There was no work with it. There was no counterbalance. There was no checks and balance system. He simply said, I think it was wrong. It was a rush to judgment. I'm going to stop it. Now, like everything else, um, this situation went to court. And the judge ruled that actually the secretary was wrong. There was not a rush to judgment by anyone other than the secretary when he suspended those leases. However, 
because there was a timing element, one of those technicalities, and those who were suing waited too long to send the lawsuit, the decision of the secretary would stand. And what the secretary said is, I'll be magnanimous, and of the 77, I'll let 17 go forward. The other 60, they stay off the table. I don't care what the regional management plan did. The end result of that was simply that you don't have a whole lot of leases that would be put out for development. Unfortunately, it has a, a ripple effect through the community because not all leases are found on federal land. There is also state land and a few, very few pieces of private land. But oftentimes they abut one another. And if you block the leasing opportunity on this piece of land, it sterilizes the leasing development opportunity on its neighbor land at the same time. Plus, if all of a sudden the Department of Interior is sending a message that they're going to be tough on this kind of development, industry gets the message and they're not going to fight that kind of issue and they will leave at the same time. The net result of this one action by the Department of Interior was unemployment in one rural county in Utah was a loss of 3,000 jobs in a county that only has 30,000 residents. The unemployment tripled over a course of months and only and solely because of this one decision. That not only did we not have the ability of, of drilling on those federal lands, but you also lost the opportunity for the private sector to go into state lands and on certain private lands, and then the ripple effect went. As they realized what simply happened is the private sector said, I'm not going to put up with this. They took the investment capital that they were willing to put into the region of rural Utah and took it somewhere else where they didn't have to deal with the Department of Interior. We have the same situation in the West in another particular area, specifically with oil shale. The U.S. Geological Survey, which oddly enough is part of the Department of Interior, has estimated that in a 16,000 square mile area of Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming, there are roughly two trillion barrels of oil that can be extracted from oil shale. That is more energy than we get from Canada. This is not a new and unusual process. Estonia and the Baltic states has been using this same process of extraction from oil shale for 80 years, and they have done it successfully and in an environmentally friendly manner. We could copy that same proposal. But no, no, once again, this administration has decided to slow walk any development, slow walk any allowance of projects to go forward to demonstrate what we can and, not, and cannot do. And the net result of losing this opportunity for oil shale is at least $1.9 trillion added to the economy of this country and projected to be up to 100,000 new jobs that would be lost simply by this one decision as well. Now, this is a small area. But you, comp you compound that fact of what is happening, not just in my state of Utah, but it's what's happening in Colorado and Wyoming and New Mexico and Nevada and the rest of the West, and you see the compounded problem we have that truly can understand why in the recession, why was the West the hardest hit? Well, because we were dealing with the federal government in a way that was certainly, not un uh, certainly unfair. I'd like to say one last thing before I, I yield back to the gentleman from New Mexico. In the last days, as the gentleman said, we have been talking about the ability of trying to jumpstart our energy portfolio, our energy self-dependence, our energy ability in three bills specifically dealing with offshore development. We have that same potential for energy development onshore as well that we need to talk about at the same time. But sometimes we also need to talk here simply about understanding how words have meaning. And we have been throwing around words in the debate of the last couple of weeks in a way that I think has been somewhat unfair and somewhat dilatory and not quite, cl has clouded the actual issue of what is going on. For example, there are those that are saying, we don't need to actually develop any new oil or gas resources. There are plenty of leases out there that aren't being produced. I want you to know when you deal with words that a lease is not the same thing as a permit to drill. And a permit to drill doesn't mean you're going to find anything for production. Just because there is a lease does not mean there is production. I had a company that was in my office today who has a lease in one of the western states. They received the lease six years ago. 
Only this year did they finally check off all the boxes, run through all the bureaucrat bureaucratic hoops, do the environmental impact statements to get the permit six years later to finally start preparing to drill to see if it is actually productive. That six years cost a lot of money to that company, which could have gone to providing work, providing jobs, as well as resources to help grow the economy of this country. That's a real cost, and that's, that is real and, and legitimate. We've heard comments before about how this country doesn't have enough oil because we don't have enough reserves to make it worthwhile. According to the CRS, Congressional Research Study, we have $1.2 trillion worth of gas that are available for production here in the United States. That puts us in the top five countries in the world for oil. We are not an oil poor country. However, when we talk about reserves, reserves are not the same thing as the amount of money that's available. Our reserves are a definition that is established by the SEC and by the definition we use, we will always have fewer reserves than other countries by definition. In addition to that, a reserve can't count as a reserve until you can actually get to it. When we put parts of this country off, we have moratorium, by definition, that takes us out of the reserve. So when someone says we don't have as many reserves as other countries, it's probably true. That doesn't mean we don't have enough oil that can be used and produced. It simply means it doesn't fit the definition. Reserve is not the same thing as amount of producible oil. Just like, as the gentleman from Georgia said, a subsidy, and we talk about all the subsidies the industries are getting, a subsidy is when the government actually pays cash to somebody. The oil companies are not getting cash from the government. A subsidy should not be confused with a tax credit or a tax deduction. If it was, when I fill out my long form and I write down my charitable contributions and get to write them off, that means the federal government is subsidizing me or subsidizing the charity to which I am giving. That doesn't make any sense. What we need to do is talk about the words as the words really are meant to be and make sure that the words are used the proper way and not for some rhetorical effort to, uh, to inflame the situation and, and reach some other result. The last word we need to talk about is simply jobs. Right now, there are twice as many government jobs as in all of manufacturing combined. In 1960, those ratios were reversed. We have gone a lot of efforts over the last two years to pass job bills, all of which produced government jobs. What we need to do is look at jobs in the private sector. In the private sector, which creates a reliable long-term job, a job that also equates wealth that goes back into the system and helps to grow our economy and grow our country. Those are the jobs we should be after, and those are the jobs we need to do. And unfortunately, we will never develop those jobs until we have a governmental energy policy that is reliable, that is not dependent on the whims of some foreign country, and that helps us develop the resources that we have in this country. We can do it and we need to do it. And I appreciate Mr. Pierce from New Mexico bringing up this issue because that's exactly what we need to do as a policy. With that, I thank the gentleman and I yield back the time to him. Thank the gentleman for his comments. He pointed out that this nation is rich in shale oil. Uh, we do, in fact, have two trillion barrels in reserve in shale. That all was outlawed uh, from use by the American consumer back in 2007. Uh, in a bill passed by Nancy Pelosi off of the floor of the House. To put that in perspective, what does two trillion barrels of, of shale oil mean? We have only used one trillion barrels of oil completely in our history. We have double in just shale oil. That's not natural gas. That's not normal petroleum. We have double in shale oil what we've consumed up to this point. Another uh, comment that was made earlier is that we subsidize and that consumers end up paying uh, for things that they don't know they're paying. Just talked to a constituent last week, said that uh, he was uh, given a tax credit for 40 percent of a solar facility that he put on his own home. That was from the federal government. 
from the state government another 10 percent, so about 50 percent of the cost of the program uh, was completely reimbursed by the government. But the big deal is they're paying him 22 cents per kilowatt hour of energy that he is able to sell back into the system. Now, that 22 cents needs to be compared to the 7 cents that electricity normally costs. So the consumer is tagged with three times the cost of electricity that is provided by solar power that is bought from individual producers. The consumer will pay more for the power. It is not, uh, it is not an easy process to understand, but consumers will ultimately pay all of the higher energy costs. We hear much today in Washington about the subsidies for big oil. Be aware that there are no subsidies for big oil. There are simply write-offs that every company is allowed to take legally, write-offs to encourage them to invest in machinery, write-offs that sound like depreciation, amortization, write-offs that are allowed by accounting techniques across the board in this country. Understand that when we begin to penalize these, these oil companies, we're going to cost America jobs. So let's talk just a bit about the, the different supposed subsidies, but in fact legitimate write-offs that companies are given. The suggestion is made that we would want to repeal the expensing of the intangible drilling cost. The intangible drilling cost usually represents 60 to 80 percent of the cost of a well. Historic U.S. policy allows a deduction for development. That's since 1913 in this government's tax code, and yet today we're talking about reversing it, a time when we're starving for jobs, 9 percent unemployment, and we're going to talk about making it harder to employ people in this country. Other businesses are able to expense their research and development projects. Pharmaceutical companies, IDC specifically targets U.S. and oil, U.S. oil and gas companies. It will discourage innovation in the energy sector at a time when we need more innovation, not less. Disallowing the expensing of intangible drilling costs will put the American consumer in a worse position and endanger American jobs. The second idea that's talked about in raising taxes for oil companies is to do away with the, the write-off, the dual capacity rule. The dual capacity rule is to ensure that income that is taxed by another nation is not also taxed by the U.S. It's something that w the U.S. has been alone in taxing double. We tax not only the amount that is made here, but the amount that is made in other countries, the profits made in other countries. That's a tax inversion that has cost us many jobs. Now then, we have the allowance, the dual capacity rule is in place to stop that, and yet our friends on the other side of the aisle are saying that we must stop this practice. All it's going to do is make the U.S. more inhospitable for investments in energy resources at a time when we're seeing $4 gasoline, at a time when our economy is struggling, when we need jobs, we're talking about making American businesses less competitive and making American jobs more scarce. The final section is maybe the most egregious of all. That is the repeal of Section 199 manufacturing exemptions for oil and gas companies. In 2004, the Congress enacted the Section 199 for manufacturing companies to encourage them to bring jobs back to this country. From 2004 to 2007, the oil and gas industry was responsible for 2 million new jobs that were created. The oil and gas companies currently support 9.2 million jobs. Almost all manufacturers receive a 9% credit that's, again, in order to encourage them to come back to this country. The oil and gas companies have only been receiving a 6% credit because they're already been, they've already been picked on by the people in this town. But now they're suggesting that we would want to completely do away with the manufacturing credit. Keep in mind, that's the refining of gasoline. That's the definition of manufacturing in oil and gas. So at a time when we're starving for jobs, we're going to make U.S. manufacturers 
the U.S. refineries less competitive, we're going to encourage Venezuela and Hugo Chavez to send more jobs there, to take more jobs and to send more gasoline here. It just doesn't make sense.